Grove. Great. Well, good morning. Thank you. Uh, I am Jeff Grove with ASTM International. You might be aware that ASTM is a nonprofit organization that works in public-private collaboration to develop voluntary consensus standards that do a number of things that aren't always easily understood or fully appreciated. Uh, some of our important standards, in fact, hundreds of our standards, are referenced here in the United States and around the world, and they do things such as uh, improve the safety of products and materials, they protect the environment, and they play other important roles in public safety. Uh, when we start talking about PHMSA, and I do want to thank PHMSA for including us in this important discussion and want to thank people like Mike Israni and Todd Del Vecchio who really engage with ASTM in providing input into helping to shape and, and uh, utilize standards that reflect the, mi the mission and the regulatory needs of, of PHMSA and its important mis mission of protecting the safety and integrity of pipelines. Uh, so many of our standards, in fact, play important roles in pipeline safety and about a dozen of them are referenced by PHMSA under the Section 24 uh, that would be exposed to the restrictions or the implications of Section 24 of the Pipeline Safety Act. Now, these standards uh, were developed by ASTM under our process, uh, our open, balanced, transparent process. They weren't developed with any federal funding provided by PHMSA or any other regulatory agency. Uh, these standards that we've, that we've developed and that are referenced by PHMSA are very technical, and they address very technical attributes of pipeline safety and integrity. Uh, some of them, their specifications, their requirements, their methods of testing. For carbon alloy steel pipe that's used in a variety of pipeline-related applications, others address plastics and epoxy resins. Uh, but the bottom line is these, they convey an awful lot of technical knowledge, which is very important for pipeline manufacturer, uh, pipeline product and system manufacturers, operators, but to the general public, I believe they have a very limited value, and in fact, the, pub the general public is probably better off accessing the executive summaries and the scopes of these standards, which are available on our website uh, at no cost. Um, so like many of the standards development organizations here in the United States and internationally, ASTM has been looking at a lot of different ways to provide public access to our reference standards, uh, but to do it in ways that don't significantly disrupt our model of operation. As one significant important step, we've worked with agencies to make ASTM standards referenced and proposed rules publicly accessible at no cost during public comment periods uh, of rulemakings. So in fact, right now, we've worked with PHMSA and uh, included in the PHMSA NPRM on HAZMAT. Uh, you go to the federal docket. It's linked to uh, the ASTM website. You go there and you can actually review the current a the ASTM standard that's being proposed to be included in this rule. And it will be up uh, during the public comment period, which closes in a few weeks. So we're not required to do this, but we recognize that there's a need for commenters to have the access to the technical requirements in the standards so that they can better inform the rulemaking process. So we do share the concern of many standards organizations with Section 24 of the Act. Uh, and as has been pointed out uh, several times today, it, it actually conflicts in many ways with existing federal policy, the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act, OMBA 119, uh, <clears throat> because it really fails to recognize the effective and efficient way that agencies utilize voluntary consensus standards in support of their regulatory mission uh, and strike the right balance um, that works for the standards development organizations and the regulated public. But finally, we think that one of the concerns we have with Section 24 is that it, it, it really underestimates or certainly doesn't appreciate the significant costs that are involved and the process that's involved in developing high-quality relevant standards that support the regulatory missions of agencies. Um, so that being said, we, we do have a long history of working with PHMSA and almost every regulatory agency in the United States and in other countries. We, uh, we continue to strive to provide access to our reference standards on a reasonable basis. The list price 
for PHMSA, the list price of these 12 standards that we're discussing uh, are actually, they range from $40 to $57 each. Um, so it's not quite the, some of the costs that were mentioned earlier today with, with some of the other standards. And, and I also want to point that many of the producers and the users and the inspectors of pipeline uh, materials and products access these standards at no cost as a benefit of their membership in ASTM. And many others that need access to this information uh, can do so through other business arrangements where they are able to access these documents at, at far lower price points. Uh, and then looking outside of PHMSA, working with other federal agencies that reference our standards, uh, we've worked to be flexible and reasonable in providing access to affected stakeholders. And one example I wanted to give was an arrangement that we struck a few years ago when Congress enacted the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. Suddenly a number of small batch and uh, hobbyists that produce toys were exposed to the requirements of the ASTM toy safety standard because Congress uh, mandated that it be enforced by CPSC. So rather than these, these small batch manufacturers purchasing the standard at $70 at the list price, we've worked out an arrangement where they can actually purchase it for less than $10. So these are the types of models that we have to work with the affected stakeholders when our standards become referenced in regulations. Uh, and those are the kind of dialogues that we hope to have with agencies and affected stakeholders. Um, but I mentioned earlier there are some costs, and I, part of this is, is really the fault of standards developers. I think we've done very little over the years to really explain the cost of standards development. So there are very real costs in, in maintaining professional staffs, providing the administration necessary, uh, facilitating the numerous number of technical meetings, facilitating the technical ballots that have to uh, go out under our processes. We have to invest in state-of-the-art technology to provide the technical infrastructure that facilitates worldwide collaboration on a 24 by 7 basis in the development standards. There's document publication, distribution. Uh, there's some significant costs in being accredited, making sure our process meets the American National Standards Institute's uh, uh, requirements. And, and finally, there's for organizations like ASTM who have a, a very global reach, there's some significant costs to being part of the global community of standards developers. Um, so when you recognize that standards development is not free, uh, one of the questions, core questions quickly becomes, well then, what's the right model to pay for the production of standards? And at ASTM, we've designed, like other SDOs, many SDOs have slightly diff different models, but our model is designed in a way to make standards development cost effective for the government, for the taxpayer, and for the users that need to access our standards. And because the costs are spread out amongst thousands of users, we're able to keep the barriers to participation very low. So today it costs about $75 to be a member of ASTM, to be active and shape standards. And for doing that, as a member, you get to access many of the standards that you work on. There's no additional project fees, upfront costs, and we don't take federal funding from agencies uh, in the United States or elsewhere. So this model's worked very well for ASTM. Uh, we produce high quality documents that meet the evolving needs of industry, the public, and government. And it's done at a very good value for small and medium-sized enterprises. In fact, 53% of all of our members at ASTM, of our 35,000 members, come from small and medium-sized enterprises, companies of 499 or less. And they like this model. So we, we're concerned that we, when we see provisions such, such as Section 24, uh, because it could require us to make some significant changes to our model. And these changes really haven't been requested by our members, and they haven't been requested by our customers, uh, yet they'd have a significant impact on the vibrancy of our standards development enterprise and, and uh, the long-term health of our organization. So if we started to do things like charge project fees and other upfront costs, we're also concerned that the impacts would really be shifted. Uh, industry would continue to pay, most likely, um, but the small businesses, the non-governmental organizations, academics, retirees, uh, there's many people active in standards development 
who do so on a volunteer basis without the benefit of significant corporate support. And these are the individuals that have the most to lose under a change in the model. Uh, there, there's other reasons as well that we're concerned. Uh, certainly, we think it would, if we stop doing what we do, it would be very difficult for the government to replicate uh, the effectiveness, the vibrancy, and the robust nature of standards development as we know it today and, and the process that served industry and uh, society so well. So I'm, I'm kind of closing here with, with maybe some thoughts about a pathway forward. Uh, I, again, want to point out that we're, we're very sensitive to the challenges of imp implementing Section 24 to PHMSA and also to, to SDOs like us. We are continuing to look at innovative ways to be cooperative. Uh, I mentioned we're already providing public access to ASTM standards referenced <coughs> by PHMSA in rulemakings during the public access period. But looking beyond the rulemakings, uh, maybe one of the things we could do is engage with PHMSA to explore any meaningful and uh, other alternative suggestions. And I'm going to disagree a little bit with Scott earlier, some of the comments he made earlier. We do think one possible pathway forward is to develop an alternative model of providing public access, and we have some experience here. Very, in the last couple of years, we've worked with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and they've collaborated with us in an arrangement that provides first responders across the nation with access to certain ASTM standards uh, under a very flexible arrangement that takes into consideration the number of standards that have been downloaded. And then each year, on an annual basis, we work with the agency, revisit the terms of the agreement, and ensure that it's still uh, resource effective for DHS, but at the same time, it still helps us to defray some of the significant costs that we've incurred in developing, maintaining, and publishing the standards. So that's just one way, uh, I'm sure there's many others, to better align the needs of the public with the legitimate concerns and needs of standards developers. Uh, and it's, a, it's one important way to do it without significantly disrupting the core of the existing system, which works so well. So I thank you for the opportunity to share some of those comments. I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of opportunities for discussion uh, later today. Uh, thanks.